And would you like it? Uh, mocha. Yeah, I'd like to have some green tea. Okay, I'll bring that up to you. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Wow, that was a lot of fun riding. Thanks for inviting me, Mike. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming. Hey, Mike, I, I got something to ask you. Mm -hmm. I need some good advice. What's up? Well, you see, my cousin, she's in this gender studies class, mm -hmm. and she's really annoyed Thank by you. this one crazy student that's trying to save herself mm -hmm. for marriage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what my cousin's thinking is that that's coming from some old, repressive fashioned ideas and it's so patriarchal, mm -hmm. and the men have all the advantage, and the women, they can't have as much as fun as the men can. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, what do you think about that? Well, actually, you could tell her that the idea of free sex is actually a very old idea. No, that's pretty hard to believe. No, really, I've been studying about this. Since the earliest civilizations, uh, spirituality has always been a central part of culture. And in the ancient Near East, religious rites involving sexual symbolism were pretty common and were designed to secure divine blessings for fertility of the land. Phallic statues were a part of festivals. You know, the gods of virtually all past civilizations were portrayed as engaging in unrestricted sexual relations. We have many examples in the land of Egypt, in Babylon, in Canaan, in the Hindu beliefs, with the multiple Greek deities, or in Rome, where the gods chase both men and women. Okay, I see what you're saying, but I can imagine what my cousin would say, that at that time, it sounds like really cool, trendy, liberty religions mm -hmm. that weren't as repressed as our society is. Mm -hmm. You know, I could, I could imagine that back then, women kind of sound more empowered, right? Not exactly. How so? Well, since sex was regarded as an act of worship, customs of ritual intercourse and sacred prostitution were major features of these fertility cults. I'm not sure how to feel about that. Sacred or temple prostitution involved male and female prostitutes who performed all kinds of activities. It was even considered an honor for boys and girls as young as 10 or 11 to be sent to temples and be trained to serve the sexual needs of strangers. Bernard Wilhelm, a German scholar, discovered an old legal document that recounts how a man delivered his own daughter to the temple of Ishtar to serve as a Harintu prostitute. Wait, that doesn't sound like liberation to me. That's more like sex trafficking and child slavery. Yeah, you're right. Sex slavery was actually built into their religions. In the words of Norman Sussman, male and female prostitutes serving temporarily or permanently and performing heterosexual, homosexual, oral genital, bestial, and other forms of sexual activities dispense their favors in behalf of the temple. Priests acted as pimps and collected some of the profits. Ritual prostitution was almost universal in the ancient world. So those poor women and girls, they were treated more than just sex slaves, huh? Yeah, and it gets worse. Um, with all this uncommitted sex going on, there had to be a way to deal with all these uh, inconvenient babies being produced. Child sacrifice and infanticide were widely practiced, both as a way to secure the favor of the gods and to remove unwanted children. Also, wealthy citizens were able to buy the children of poor people to offer as sacrifices instead of having their own offspring killed. That's evil. Yeah, the norm of the ancient world uh, was pretty much rampant sexual expression of men with women, men with men, women with women, adults having sex with children, animals, uh, you get the idea. Okay, yeah, I get it. But if the ancient times was filled with, you know, free sex and prostitution and child sacrifice and slavery, but how did it all change now? Mm. Well, in the midst of all these free love religions, a shocking idea arose among a nomadic clan that believed not in many gods, but in one God who created the entire universe. And this God was different from all the others worshiped elsewhere. The first book of the Hebrew Bible offers a radically different narrative of creation in which God's intention was expressed through His Word and had the power to bring the universe into existence. It was an act of His will, not a creation through sexual acts. I see. This was a revolutionary break with all other religions, and it alone changed human history. Judaism placed limits on sexual activity. Sex was to be sanctified from the world and placed in the bed of the husband and wife. Each man was taught to invest his sexual energy into his wife only, not into a number of male, female, child, or animal partners. 
These restrictions of sexual behavior enabled society to progress by raising the status of women and of the offspring born to the couples. Okay, that makes sense to me. And since Christianity was founded by the Jewish Messiah Jesus, it inherited and spread the same view that the proper place for sex is in marriage. This could be called good sex versus the rampant ancient bad sex with all of its undesirable consequences. Wow, you know, I never thought of it that way. And actually, uh, God's guidance about sex goes back to the very first book of the Bible. I'm sure you're familiar with the story in Genesis of God commanding uh, Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, I remember that from Sunday school, uh, but I don't see the connection. So here's the thing. There are several interpretations of that story, but I don't believe the fruit was literal or was referring to some type of intellectual knowledge. Look, here it states, now the man knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bore Cain. This biblical word used for sexual intercourse has the same root as the word knowledge of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge that God was warning about was in fact carnal knowledge. So what you're saying is sex. Yes. The Genesis story suggests that the fall involved the misuse of sexual love. We see the same use of this expression to know in many parts of the scriptures, like in the Genesis account of the two angels who destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. The people demand that Lot bring the two visitors out of his house so that they may know them. Lot begs them not to act so wickedly. But going back to the Genesis 3 story, after Adam and Eve ate the fruit, it says their eyes opened and they became aware that they were naked, so they covered their lower sexual parts. It shows they felt guilty and ashamed for misusing this part of their bodies. They did not cover their mouth to hide something they had eaten. And what is the biblical meaning of nakedness? Leviticus 18 describes it as a disgraceful and shameful act such as incest or pedophilia. None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother, your father's wife, sister, and so on, you shall not uncover. Uncovering someone's nakedness in the Bible obviously means having illicit sex with that person. For Adam and Eve to know their nakedness suggests their transgression involved a sexual act. Clearly, humanity's separation from God did not involve the act of eating a literal fruit, but rather a sexual relationship that did not take place at the right time with God's blessing. Wow, I never thought that deeply about the story of Adam and Eve and what it really meant. I mean, it kind of makes sense when you really think about the fruit, it must have represented something so tempting as sex. Exactly. And God's commandment not to eat was more than just him testing their obedience and then vindictively punishing them with death. God instead was trying to protect them until they were mature enough to become responsible parents. They needed that commandment because they were too young to understand it yet. The Archangel Lucifer, depicted as a serpent in the Genesis story, was supposed to guide Adam and Eve while they grew to maturity, but instead he misled and misused them for his own benefit. And as God warned, the first biblical family experienced great pain and dysfunction. Through their disobedience, Adam and Eve encountered spiritual death, meaning separation from God, which resulted in a premature physical death of their son Abel, who was killed by his older brother, Cain. Listen, Ryan, God's commandment to the first family in the Bible uh, wasn't just for them, it also applies to us. Do not have sex before marriage and do not engage in adulterous acts with people whom you're not married to. Okay, I get what you're saying. I guess I gotta see what my cousin thinks about this. But you know, how do you know that what you call bad sex is exactly a bad influence on our society? You know, we're not living like the ancient civilizations in the past with you know, temple prostitution and child sex slavery. Mm. Well, women may not be forced into temples to engage in ritual prostitution and stuff, but forced prostitution and sex trafficking are still rampant in the US and around the world. And while we no longer burn live babies as offerings to Molech or Baal, the economy of bad sex requires disposing of inconvenient unborn children up until the moment of birth through abortion. Isn't that a form of infanticide? And these are just some of the problems that come from a culture that promotes uncommitted sex. Practicing uncommitted bad sex is not cool or progressive. It doesn't lead to liberation and happiness, but to emotional and spiritual pain, difficult lives, and sometimes to sickness or death. 
Practicing good sex leads to more love and commitment between you and your spouse and benefits your children and future generations. Okay, you and the Bible make a very convincing case. I'm just gonna have to wait on Alyssa, my cousin. You know, she just needs a little bit more facts and evidence about this. Yeah, sure, that's no problem. Hey, how about we meet next week and let's see what Alyssa thinks about this. Yeah, that sounds good, take your time. Hey, Mike. Hey. Hey, this is my cousin Alyssa. Hey, Alyssa, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Mike. All right. Ryan was telling me all about the shocking things you shared with him. Mm -hmm. But since I'm more of a science girl than a Bible girl, I did my own research. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I was pretty surprised by what I found. Mm -hmm. Of course, to state the obvious, Couples who wait until marriage and are faithful to each other have basically zero risk for sexually transmitted diseases. But I also found out other benefits, such as men and women who save sex for the marriage bed are much less likely to get divorced and more likely to be faithful. They experience more satisfaction and more fulfilling sex than singles who just hook up with each other or just live together. Married women are more likely to report that sex makes them feel loved, wanted, and taken care of, and they are less likely to report that sex makes them feel anxious, scared, or guilty. Children born to faithful married parents also benefit, as they are much less likely to live in poverty. They also experience a safer environment and are less likely to have emotional and behavioral problems. They do better in school, I found out that being in a committed marriage is also good for one's health and married couples live longer. They also have more sex than unmarried singles. There are other benefits, but you get the idea. How come my gender studies professor didn't teach me any of this? Mm. What a liar. I never paid much attention to the Bible before, but I have to admit its guidance on saving sex for marriage seems to be confirmed by science. Wow, uh, you're teaching me things that I didn't even know. You know, God gives us his commandments because he loves us and wants us to be happy and even have a good love life. After all, God designed men and women's bodies to fit together when they make love. So obviously he's not a prude. I still have a lot of questions, but if what you're saying is as true as it seems, I may have to sue my university for malpractice mm. and get a refund. Who would have thought the Bible teaches people how to have good sex? Like, once I go home and tell my buddies about this, they are not gonna believe it.